Until the defeat of the Concord Navy at Robsart in early 2581, the Lion's share of Starleague naval assets were assigned to Task Force Taurus. This factor, more than any other, had delayed the invasions of the two as yet unengaged periphery realms. After Marshal Cardenas withdrew the battered remnants of her fleet, the door was thrown wide open for the commencement of Operation Mailed Fist against the Rimworld's Republic and Operation Union Hold against the Outworld's Alliance. The first actions taken by the SLDF after the naval victory at Robsart was the mass redeployment of troops across the entire Inner Sphere. Three divisions had already crossed the Inner Sphere from their Torian garrison to their staging posts on Trelwan. Travelling with them was 4th Corps' Major General Legat, while Major General Aaron Show took command of 6th Corps' detachment, whilst Harman Vries remained behind with the 18th Division for their assault on Werfer. Also making the journey was a fleet of warships. The Marrick Auxiliary was further reinforced with the addition of a pair of regiments from Task Force Canopus, who in turn were replaced by two other Fusiliers of Orient units. Comparing the strength of Task Force Mailed Fist is difficult given the civil war that was still smouldering within the Republic, but even if we take the RWA as a single entity, the SLDF had a 3 to 1 advantage both on the ground and in space. Task Force Outworlds was also receiving the extra troops Major General Furlow had been waiting for. Fifth Corps had spent most of the war garrisoned within the Capellan Confederation, waiting to see if they would be required to fight either against the Canopians or the Taurians. Now their time to shine had arrived, and they took up positions along the Outworlds front. A DCMS Auxiliary Corps also added to the strength of Operation Union Hold. Lastly, Naval Task Force 82 gave them complete control in space, as the Outworlds Alliance lacked any warships of its own. The OAM had been busy these past two years, since their clandestine armament program had expanded with the aid of the Federated Suns. By this point, each world could now field at least one battalion of armoured vehicles in defence, and the 1st Alliance Battlement Regiment had expanded to four battalions. The old converted industrial mechs were phased out entirely for proper war machinery. The additional forces on both sides meant they maintained a relative parity in numbers, though the SLDF was certainly better equipped. By May, the SLDF reinforcements were in position. General Isaacson had a conservative two-year plan to take a half a dozen worlds along the Corwood border before making the final attack on Apollo itself. Once the capital was under their control, he estimated it would take no more than three years to put an end to the Rim Provisional Government. They had more than enough resources to accomplish this modest goal. On May 9th, the first assault began on Treeline, a world garrisoned by one of the RPG units. At first, they made no efforts to contest the landing, but after the Starly commander called for their surrender, they refused and began skirmishing attacks against the far larger force. The 8th Dragoons lacked any mechs, but they used their light cavalry forces excellently to prolong the fight for three months, even after which small pockets of resistance continued to hold out until the end of the year. At Persistence and Star's End, the invaders faced a battalion of loyal Amaris troops and were under strict orders to keep casualties to a minimum. The Persistence garrison took up arms as soon as the SLDF entered the system and fired upon them as they attempted to make landfall. In the case of the asteroid-ridden Star's End system, the defenders went into hiding and tried to avoid a confrontation altogether. In both instances, the majority of the resistance had been dealt with by the end of the third month. Notably, the Starlink Navy would begin construction on a naval refit yard at Novo Crescitus, a facility that still operates in a limited capacity to this day. The last move in this first wave was the Lyran Auxiliary Corps, who had responsibility for the defence of the SLDF's flank. No RWA units were stationed on Black Earth, so the LIC had predicted minimal resistance. However, they failed to notice the aerospace fighter detachment that would provide such a challenge to the Sky Rangers once they touched down. Across the Inner Sphere, talks between the Federated Suns and the Outworlds Alliance were continuing, and this partnership would culminate in the signing of the Tancredi Accords on June 5th. In exchange for the territorial ceding of a dozen border worlds, the Federation agreed to continue supplying the periphery nation with armaments, while also surreptitiously purchasing space on the Caritan and Star League transports bound for occupied worlds to smuggle arms and aid to those in need once the invasion was underway. That invasion got the final go-ahead one month later on July 6th, and now the Star League was officially at war with every one of the periphery realms. Their first moves were to consolidate the gains they had made back in 2572 under Directive 21. Since then, a battalion of SLDF forces, or DCMS forces in the case of Santiago, had been stationed on each world. Apart from a changing of the guard when 6th Corps was reassigned in 2578, very little had occurred during their occupation. Union Hold saw those battalions' parent units move in, they set about creating major staging posts, and soon after, the majority of 2nd and 5th Corps were on world. Only on Santiago was there resistance to this change. Indeed, the Outworlds would continue to fund and supply guerrilla movements on that planet, even after the conclusion of the Reunification War. In the first wave of Operation Union Hold, the SLDF first took aim at four worlds. Bryceland, Groveld, Wiesel, and Shermak. 
Each had a small armour consignment of 7, 6, 4 and 5 companies respectively, and a militia infantry regiment of no more than 600. Each would soon be tasked with the impossible job of resisting a full SLDF brigade. Bryceland had the largest militia and lasted a mere two days before the governor surrendered on July 28th. On Shermak, the defenders were so overwhelmed that Lieutenant General Simone de Martino gave special instructions to avoid a bloodbath. It was a near bloodless contest with only a little over 100 wounded and just 11 killed in action. The 56th and 156th regiments were left behind as garrisons as the brigades prepared to move on. Defenders on Groveld and Wiesau were more tenacious. The assaults began on July 24th and August 2nd respectively. Both planets were chiefly mining worlds which meant the population was widely dispersed in small communities. The 1st Groveld Armour Battalion held on until the end of September, while on Wiesel, the SLDF strategy of to starve out the defenders led them to turning on each other after several made favourable business contracts with their invaders. Forlo was not impressed by his subordinates' efforts to avoid bloodshed and demanded a direct assault which would ultimately lead to high casualties on both sides. By November 17th, the last of the four worlds was declared pacified. The DCMS Auxiliary Corps had one target during the first wave, the world of Tabayama. Unbeknownst to the Outworlds Alliance, planetary governor Hiroshi Bartusiak had secretly been conversing with his Kuritan neighbours. He hoped to retain his position of power after the inevitable conquest. Shosho Aguchi specifically requested Tabayama, believing he was onto an easy victory. Only a single Draconis regiment was dispatched, which should have been more than enough to overpower the one militia armour battalion. What he didn't know was that two more battalions of the OAM's 1st Armoured Division had taken up position on World. This was the last thing Bartusiak wanted and he made life difficult for those forces who had ostensibly come to his aid. When the invaders arrived on August 11th, the governor immediately surrendered. One of the first locations secured by the DCMS were the starports where the OAM dropships were parked and those forces would surely have been quickly rounded up were it not for the outraged public response to Bartusiak's surrender. All across the planet, riots flared up which gave the OAM enough time to withdraw and consolidate. These protests soon turned violent and the Combine forces responded in kind. Hundreds were killed before the First Armoured launched an attack of their own on the starport, securing it just long enough for them to retake control of their dropships and escape off-world with the two surviving companies and 2,000 civilians in tow. Demonstrations against Bartusiak continued into 2582 until he was replaced by a new governor from the Draconis Combine. The old traitor survived just two weeks without Curita support. With eight worlds already under Star League control, Forlo felt confident in taking the first step in his plan to end the war quickly and decisively with a direct assault on the Alliance capital of Alpharance. In theory, only a single world stood in his way, the planet Sevon. The planetary militia on this world was no greater than that he had already faced, two battalions of armour and two regiments of infantry. But Forlo suspected the OEM had a presence there too, and he wasn't wrong. 4th Division had brought a mixed regiment of their own, plus a pair of companies from the 1st Alliance Battleman Regiment and two squadrons of the rare Alliance Aerospace Fighters. On October 3rd, Forlo took personal command of the invasion at the head of two divisions from his own 2nd Corps. 2nd Corps had barely touched down with a small force when they received a startling communication. A man purporting to be a Davian Guards colonel claimed that Savon was a Federated Sun's protector ship and that the SLDF must withdraw. Forlo rolled his eyes at this obvious ruse and commanded the handful of infantry and mech companies that had already made landfall to attack the rogue mech company. Almost instantly, the dozen mechs painted in Davian colours ballooned into a full regiment supported by Alliance armour. Forlo was dumbstruck when within 30 minutes his advance had turned into a rout and he was pushed back to his dropships, desperately holding out while he waited for aid from the 6th Royal Division. What exactly had he stumbled into on Savon? Four months earlier, when the Outworlds Alliance and Federated Sons signed the Tancredi Accords, a secret provision had been included that would drastically alter the course of the war. Lawrence Davian returned to his father with an understanding that the AWFS would raise a force of mercenaries to fight and defend Davian interests within the Alliance to secure land rights and future trade deals. Alexander had turned to his own Davian guard looking for volunteers. Many of his most experienced and trusted troops accepted early retirement to join the ranks of this new mercenary force, and at its helm was appointed Colonel Elias Pitcairn who in turn would become its namesake. Centuries later, the exploits of the Pitcairn Legion are still venerated by the citizens of the Federated Sons. It had taken until October to form this new unit, which now boasted three regiments of battle mechs and one of aerospace fighters. Their arrival on Savon would transform the defence of that world and in so doing they would become Forlow's nemesis. While Pitcairn and the OAM were laying siege to the General, the 6th Royal came under attack from the two other Legion regiments while their aerospace fighters established air superiority over the battlefields. This allowed them to keep the division bottled up within their LZ. 
the Davian forces destroying any that ventured beyond the safety of their dropships, while daring tech crews salvaged anything that they could reach. 4th Division, who had grounded nearby, was slow in their response. Pitcairn had anticipated their arrival for hours before they eventually materialised, and the Colonel was forced to withdraw. Nevertheless, it was a major victory for the OAM, their combined efforts accounting for the destruction of more than 200 tanks and battle mags, and even 6 dropships. Forlow was outraged. From his perspective, this was an act of war by the Federated Sons against the Star League. He responded by issuing a $1 million bounty on Pitcairn's head, sure that some enterprising civilian would deal with this problem for him. Not content to wait, however, 4th Division was broken into detachments and sent out to find the Pitcairn Legion, who emerged from concealed positions to score further victories over the isolated units, until both sides were dragged into a prolonged engagement at Big Tusk. By the third day, every SLDF and OAM unit on the planet was engaged here. The battle drew on until October 12th, when a joint message derived from the First Lord and First Prince that called for the two commanders to cease hostilities and let the situation on Savon be handled politically. An uneasy truce settled on Savon, but Forlow did not delay and called in his DCMS auxiliaries, wagering that they would have little compulsion about fighting Davian forces. On October 26th, three regiments of Gallard and regulars made landfall, and the Star League forces quickly closed in for the kill. Pitcairn though had been expecting just such an eventuality. Thankfully, President Avalar's orders to withdraw had come, so the defenders prepared for departure. The Legion fought a rearguard action for two days before finally lifting off late on the 28th. Just like on Santiago, covert shipments to guerrilla forces on Savon would leave it a contested world for the duration. On the same day, 13th Brigade was landing on Medrin. This was a world with a stronger planetary militia than any other the Star League had yet encountered during Operation Union Hold. Four armor battalions, a total of 200 vehicles, and two motorized infantry regiments would pose a not insignificant threat to the three regular army regiments making landfall. The planetary defense chairman wisely avoided direct engagement during the first two weeks, during which time he scored a battalion's worth of mech and armor kills at the cost of one of his own comparatively lighter armor battalions. He followed this up by capturing a Star League supply dump from which he was able to arm another volunteer regiment. The defense of the city of Axel was the turning point of the campaign. The defenders were at risk of collapsing under sustained fire, but the timely arrival of Ratti's forces was able to temporarily beat back the SLDF. This came at a heavy cost, however, as only a few militia armor companies survived the battle. Mallet was now faced with the uncomfortable prospect of having to level the entire city. For now, she was content to sit back and wait for further orders from Forlo. Unfortunately for the people of Medron, Mallet's report on the situation reached Forlo just after another. Since their humiliating defeat at the Battle of Tentativa, the AWFS Auxiliary Corps on the Taurian front had been extremely slow to maneuver and was lagging well behind the SLDF. A measly three escort warships remained to guard their limited transports, far too few to safeguard those vessels against even the now devastated Concord Navy. For some time, Alexander Davian had been beseeching the High Council to spare more ships so that he could take an active part in the war again. With his troops now unofficially committed within the Outworlds Theatre, Davian saw that the moment was right to threaten drastic action. If he did not receive naval assistance immediately, he would withdraw his forces from the war and take no further part like his neighbours in the Capellan Confederation. Ian Cameron relented, but found that the only warships that were available belonged to SLN Task Force 82, assigned to Major General Forlow. Despite the protestations of Commanding General Lee, Forlow received the orders that a full third of his navy was to be immediately reassigned. Until this point, he had held out hope of pushing on from Savon to Alpharats by year's end, but his orders left him no choice. They also left him as a swirling ball of rage. When news of Medron's continued resistance reached him, he ordered Mallet to take the most extreme action. The population of the planet was to be decimated. One in every ten civilians was rounded up and executed, and it was promised that this would continue until all militia resistance surrendered. It took only a few hours for the planetary defense chairman to surrender, but by which time over 10,000 had already been killed. Pleased with how effective this tactic had been, Forlow made it his standing practice on all planetary occupations, something his officers had no qualms about carrying out. Because of this, the Outworlds campaign became one of the most costly to human life. Back on the Rimworlds border, the Lyran Commonwealth began suffering from raiding attacks perpetrated by both the RWA and Rift Republican Army. These were little more than company strength strikes at targets of opportunity, and were quickly driven off by the alert LCAF defenders. This all changed with the shock and attack on the provincial capital of Alarion. This deep strike into Commonwealth territory managed to cause significant damage to the planet's starport facilities before the battalion of raiders were pushed back to their dropships. Despite attempts to intercept them in space, the RA troops were able to make their escape back into the periphery. The effect of this raid was profound. 
the Archon had won several conceits from the Star League by playing up the dangers of antagonizing one of their neighbors, but the threat was never truly believed by the inhabitants of the Commonwealth. Suddenly, they were faced with a very real possibility of repeated attacks causing considerable damage. Viola Stein and Dinesen approached General Isaacson and demanded a change in the way they were approaching Operation Mailed Fist. Until this point, all their efforts had been focused around Apollo, leaving the Rimworld's troops within the other districts, both rebel and loyal, free reign to do as they pleased. The Archon wanted to see simultaneous assaults along the border, as was being done on all other fronts. This threatened to delay the invasion by years, but faced with the prospect of the Lyrans withdrawing entirely, potentially even from the Star League itself, Isaacson's hand was forced. Within a single month, Operations Mailed Fist and Union Hold that had begun so promisingly were now facing years of setbacks because of the actions of two of the Council Lords. The Archon's efforts to keep her people safe, though perfectly reasonable to us, actually alienated her from her co-commanders, both Star League and Free Worlds. The first Princess meddling was openly belligerent and recognised by all. Curiously, Ian Cameron never called him out on it, and there were even some insinuations that he was behind the leaks that led the OAM to reinforce Savon ahead of Forlo's arrival. By mid-December, Alexander Davian had his ships, and the stagnant AWFS Auxiliary Corps was finally ready to make some moves. The Certus Fusiliers descended on Pierce on the 22nd, while the Avalon Hussars followed it up with the invasion of Weipe one week later. In both instances, the Torian defenders sacrificed many of their own citizens to delay the inevitable. Early fighting on Pierce was relatively minor, until the Capellan March forces took up positions within the cities. In February, a series of enormous bombs were detonated under the surface of numerous major population centers that sunk whole structures and roads down into the sewer system. 12,000 civilians died in the initial blast alone. The 7th Certus Fusiliers were particularly badly hit, losing more than half the regiment to those terrorist bombs. So much time was lost trying to dig their equipment out that the planet would continue to resist for a full year. On Weipe, a scorched earth policy enacted by the defenders sent thousands of tons of foodstuffs and fuel up in flames. From this dense smoke, the militia fighters would emerge and ambush the invaders. Like on Pierce though, this cloud of toxic fumes did as much damage to the natives as the outworlders. Soon, medicine was being imported in bulk by the Federated Sons to try and deal with the humanitarian crisis. Final victory came in October 2582. Amos Forlow may have lost his ability to transport a large enough force to take Alpharats, but he still had ample transports to continue his advance spinward into the heart of the Outworlds Alliance. Forlow's task force began their second wave when the General ordered the dual invasions of Kennard and Pitkin on January 6th, 2582. Senior Chairman Welkins Nord was taken by surprise by the direction of this new attack. Both were worlds bordering the Federated Suns and outside of what was perceived as the invasion corridor. They'd had the bulk of their militia redeployed elsewhere and had barely a battalion of light armor to defend themselves. Both fell within a couple of days. Forlow's new strategy came into focus with his next choice of target, Tancredi 4. By focusing his attention along their shared border, there was no question that Forlow was seeking to isolate the two unofficial allies. The world's farmers put up little resistance, and there wasn't even a militia unit to protect them. The planet was in Star League hands as soon as their troops made landfall. Tancredi had acted as a way station for the illegal passing of arms from the Federated Suns into the periphery for over five years. Still, the scope of their operation remained hidden to the Star League despite weeks of searching. Only when a small force of dropships lifted off from a remote mountain region was the SLDF able to discover the base of operations, but found no conclusive evidence within that could be traced back to House Davian. The DCMS Auxiliary Corps was making their next move during this period. Their next target was the world of Valentina, but here they would begin to rue the cruelty of their past occupations. The citizens of Valentina, faced with the prospect of another Medrin, had taken a vote to determine whether to resist the Star League when they inevitably came calling. Surrender seemed preferable, but when it was the DCMS who made landfall instead of the SLDF, the planet's population rose up in rebellion. The Curitans soon found themselves dealing with another Santiago. Unfortunately for the civilians, the invaders doubled down on their cruelty, and again implemented the policy of decimation to crush resistance. Throughout the invasion of the Outworlds Alliance, one unit that was routinely underutilized was Major General Laszlo Hooker's 5th Corps. The reason for this was that Forlow simply believed that the General and his men were incompetent, and tasked them with little more than garrison and rearguard in the early war. Hooker, though, was a longtime friend of Commanding General Lee, and voiced his displeasure of being left on the sidelines to him. Lee's subsequent orders to the task force commander left no room for dissension. Haynesville was a relatively inconsequential world that Forlow believed that would be enough to placate his Lickspittle colleague. The invasion was tasked to the 37th Royal Brigade, who made landfall on February 7th. 
Despite early reports indicating that the world had been pacified, a sharp uptick in militia attacks a week later left the regular army troops bruised and bloodied. The planetary militia seemed particularly adept at anti-mech and anti-armour tactics. This proficiency was a result of the efforts of Captain Joshua March, a former AFFS soldier who had become de facto leader of the resistance. His specially trained battalion racked up two dozen kills and managed to evade pursuit for the first three weeks of the invasion. Sexton saw that he was going to need additional support to take the world and sent out a request for reinforcements. Things took a dramatic turn going into the fourth week. On the third day of March, reinforcements arrived, but they weren't for the SLDF. A detachment of the Pitcairn Legion touched down and promptly linked up with the Outworlds militia. Numbers were not on their side, but the two commanders fooled Sexton into thinking he faced a far larger force. By the end of the month, the supply situation among the SLDF was so dire that the Lieutenant General was prepared to talk terms. On March 29th, he formally surrendered his brigade to the Pitcairn Legion. The militia wasted no time in taking stock of their newly acquired machinery. The Royal Brigade was outfitted with the most advanced technology the Star League possessed, and now it was in the hands of the ragtag group of former farmers. On March 31st, they detected the arrival of the 39th Brigade, giving them six days to load up and retreat off-world, even taking Sexton's dropship squadron with them. When Forlo heard of what had happened, he personally departed for Hainesville. He could not believe the initial reports, but regrettably for Thomas Sexton, they had not been exaggerated. If Forlo had been angry at having to call off his attack on Alpha Routes the previous year, he was positively apoplectic upon discovering that the OAM had made off with two regiments of tax and battle mechs. In the ensuing months, Starleague Intelligence would report on the formation of two new units on Alpha Routes, formed around the stolen tech, the Pitkin Legion and Santiago Carabineers. The furious general used this opportunity to clean house. Every officer within the 37th Royal Brigade above lieutenant grade was imprisoned for cowardice and dereliction of duty. The commander of the 13th Division and his immediate subordinate were sacked, as were 5th Corps' top brass, the Major General Laszlo Hooker. In a twist of fate, Carlos Lee would subsequently appoint Hooker as the SLDF's operations director, responsible for the creation of new strategies across all fronts. Forlow had, in effect, promoted him. Forlow's campaign along the border would have continued had it not been for the quick actions of Alexander Devian, who again dispatched his son Lawrence to come to an agreement with Ambassador Considine on Hazelhurst. Five of the planets that had been promised to the Federated Sons were promptly garrisoned by Devian troops. It was a peaceful occupation and one that would avoid retaliation from Forlow for the time being. A few months earlier on the Torian front, General Charles Mainstein Wexworth's tenure as the commander of Operation Bullrun was coming to an end. On January 17th, his replacement arrived and immediately relieved him of office. General Amalthea Kincaid was something of a protégé to the commanding general, and at the time of her promotion to the head of Strategic Simulations Command in 2577, was the youngest full general in the SLDF. Kincaid had spent most of her career in various staff positions on account of her near-fatal encounter with Pingree Fever that had left her physically disabled, but her military mind was one of the sharpest, and it was hoped she would revolutionise the campaign against the Torian Concordat. Her first actions were to reorganise all the units under her command. She had brought with her a sizeable force of replacements that allowed her to fill in the gaps within her units, but also took this opportunity to change their internal structure, beginning the transition within the SLDF from combined arms mixed regiments into focused single type units. Lastly, she plucked from the various corps battalions that had distinguished themselves and formed them into a new provisional brigade. This new unit, known as the Striker Brigade, was under the command of her chief of staff, Elias Priest. These changes would take time, so while her force was reorganising, Kincaid dispatched 1st, 2nd and 3rd fleets in late February to clear the path towards her first wave of targets. The 1st swept through the Bromhead system, while 3rd spent more than a month tracking down elusive fireships around Rollis. But the main goal was Horsham, one of the last Torian shipyards outside of the Hades cluster and the source of the dreaded fireships. Many of these suicidal vessels were present in the system, along with a small flotilla of defence dropships. Around the orbital facilities were a trio of the now scarce Torian warships, a second squadron covering the Nadir shipyards. The SLN spent most of February covertly monitoring the system, and on the 21st saw an opportunity when two more warships materialised at the Nadir and docked for repairs. Second Fleet arrived at the jump point en masse, and spent the next two days laying waste to the Concorde Navy. All five of the precious warships were destroyed, along with dozens of smaller vessels, as were the shipyards themselves, though this was due to Torian saboteurs. Pekatoru cleared the system's zenith before heading towards the main world, along the way catching the second warship squadron and racking up another three kills. Elsewhere on the front, one of Wexworth's final initiatives was put into action by the new general. Kincaid lost the 6th Corps to the Rimworld's front almost immediately, and the remainder of this 4th Corps was expected to depart as soon as possible. 
Wexworth had hoped to keep them tied down by ordering an attack on the heavily defended Carmichael, a plan that Kincaid saw the good sense in. Therefore, the attack commenced on March 8th. Carmichael was always going to be an exercise in patience for any attacker. The world was abundant in rich ore veins, but this meant the population was dispersed across hundreds of small mining communities. The surface was an extremely unpleasant place, and powerful storms made air support an impossibility. All this meant a very, very long battle lay ahead for 4th Corps. By year's end, 10 months of fighting had succeeded in subjugating around 10% of the planet's quarter million population. Back in March, Kincaid's recruiting spree had made possible the formation of an entirely new unit that would go some way to offsetting the loss of four divisions to General Isaacson's Rimwell's campaign. The 11th Provisional Corps would have the new Striker Brigade at its head, while Priest was promoted to Major General and given overall command. Three more brigades would fill out the remainder of the understrength 31st and 32nd divisions. To avoid future confusion, it's worth noting now that the Task Force Taurus ROC created this new unit without proper diligence, as there was by this point already a 31st and 32nd division fighting with the 8th Provisional, and so the 11th was actually the 12th SLDF Corps. Thankfully, the units were on opposite ends of the inner sphere, and the discrepancy was resolved post-war. 11th Corps got their combat debut on March 13th with the attack on Bromhead. This heavily industrialised world was a major supplier of heavy armour for the TDF. The attack began with an extremely aggressive drop right on top of the strongest offensive, something that would become the hallmark of the 11th Provisional. Though the initial strikes went well, they soon ran into heavy opposition. The defenders activated four regiments of tanks awaiting shipment off-world, and used them to deadly effect. The 92nd Brigade took 50% casualties before taking the world. Things went no better on Rollis, source of petrochemicals used across the Concordat. The invasion started on March 29th, and as before, met with early success. One of the few intact industrial centres captured by the SLDF was taken by the 94th Brigade during their landing. But on June 9th, Torian forces broke through the line, and the ensuing battle caused an enormous chemical spill that immediately brought widespread misery to the planet. Furthermore, this accidental disaster effectively removed the restraints from deliberate chemical weapon attacks, and many more followed. The effects on the planet and its inhabitants were appalling, and the SLDF fared little better. The Strikers finally saw action on April 9th, when they arrived at Horsham. Bakatoru and Dekos demonstrated a masterclass in teamwork between the Navy and regular army, and systematically dismantled the planet's defenders over the course of the next five months, taking several production centres intact, complete with their workforce. Both Horsham and Bromhead fell in September, whereupon reinforcements were sent to finish the campaign on Rollis by the end of the year. The 11th Provisional had acquitted themselves well, the Strike Brigade especially proving to be an elite force right out of the gate. Between them, they had succeeded in wiping out the remainder of the Torian 2nd Corps, which would not reform until after the war. However, casualties suffered by the 11th numbered at over 10,000, a tall price to pay for only three worlds taken. The only other conquest came from the AWFS auxiliaries, who took Verdigris after six months of skirmishing. But what of 1st and 3rd Corps? They were held in reserve throughout 2582, after several Starleague and Davian intelligence missions were ambushed and destroyed in the Spinwood regions of the Concordat. Several incursions into the Inner Sphere resulted in the loss of five supply convoys and led Kincaid to believe a counterattack was imminent, but for the time being, she was unsure where it would arrive. Across the Inner Sphere, Isaacson had finished reorganising his task force into three battle groups. Each was assigned a province and fought within their area of influence almost independently. Duke Narinda Salaj would work with 4th Corps towards Timbuktu, the Archon would take the 8th Provisional to Finnmark Province, and General Isaacson led the now reunited 6th Corps against Apollo. Twice in 2582 did the SLDF go up against the Loyalist RWA and both times faced resistance. Beginning in July, Salaj ordered the double strength 11th Royal Division to Hellbent. The 6th Amaris Legionnaires were a heavy armour regiment and did their best to fight off the invaders, but were bested in short order. Steiner Dinesen tasked the 8th Corps with Bucklands, but they had more trouble with the Light Armour Regiment of the 2nd Fusiliers, who, along with the Planetary Militia, fought on for seven months. Things were hotting up in the Canopian Theatre around this time as well. Royal Fox and Linden Marle had fallen in March and July respectively, despite a respectable defence from the Chasseur à Cheval. To try and prevent the Captain General from gaining momentum, a pair of raids were launched by the MAF, but the attack on Eleusis was abandoned as soon as the Canopians arrived in system and came face to face with three SLN squadrons. They escaped without incident. Manny and Manic decided it was time to give the Magistrix and Buqua a taste of their own medicine, and began a series of raiding missions of her own, with one very notable target. The Canopian fleets were shocked by the sudden appearance of Starleague warships within the Canopus system itself. 
The ships withdrew after a brief clash, but it was clear that the war was coming to a conclusion. To help it along, Marion chose the distant world of Tetsuki as our next target. Thought to be well outside the area of operations, this world was vital to the sustained operation of the MAF forces, housing one of the few facilities outside the capital capable of servicing mechs. In late 2582, this important outpost was occupied by the 3rd Light Horse. On September 3rd, two Manic battalions made an unexpected appearance at Teski and set about causing trouble after making landfall. The 3rd Light Horse took the rare opportunity to engage with superior numbers and sallied out to fight off the invaders. However, the Marek militia refused to get bogged down and withdrew ever further from the capital city. This continued for a week until suddenly a Star League fleet appeared in orbit. The two rare Canopian corvettes were crushed and the SLDF wasted little time in making landfall. Even so, they were moments too late to prevent the Light Horse from withdrawing back into the city, having very nearly been drawn too far from their defences in the pursuit of the earlier invaders. Instead of a short engagement then, the stranded Canopian mechs battled for three weeks before they were finally surrounded. It should have ended there, but despite the Star League offering to accept a surrender, the Light Horse fought on until the last battle mech fell. The third Light Horse was the first MAF unit to be destroyed and was a terrible loss for the Canopians, not to mention the two precious warships lost in orbit. The last of the fighting that took place in 2582 was part of Operation Union Hold and saw two old enemies face off again for the first time since the Age of War. With 5th Corps in disarray after the disaster on Haynesville and 2nd Corps otherwise occupied, the conquest of Budigan fell to the DCMS Auxiliary. The 4th Benjamin Regulars' departure for the Outworlds had been delayed due to equipment problems and lack of available transports, but now was their time to shine. Taisar Keita led from the front, landing with his first wave of troops expecting an easy victory over the planetary militia, which was little more than a handful of light armour and mechanised infantry companies. What he was not expecting was the 2nd Pitcairn Legion, who emerged from the autumn storms to wreak havoc among the Draconis forces. Keita turned on the civilian population to try and force a surrender, but was ambushed again by the Legion and planetary militia. His saving grace came with the arrival of the harsh winter, which forced the Pitcairn Legion to withdraw, or else become stranded on Budigan for the rest of the year. Angered by the loss of face and First Lord Ian Cameron's refusal to stand up to the Davian double dealing along the Outworld's Fed Sun's border, Coordinator Hihiro Kirita issued orders to the DCMS Auxiliary Corps to abandon their planned offensive against Kizoban alongside Forlo's troops and turn instead to juicier targets along their own border with the Alliance. A trio of invasions were launched concurrently in September against Kazanka, Zlatusi, and Nexus Free. Each world was assigned five regiments, two infantry, two armour, and one mech which was deemed more than sufficient. Defending the planets was the well-equipped 1st and 2nd Armour Divisions, supported by a few lances of the 1st Alliance Battlement Regiment. But what Akushi hadn't counted on was the tenacity and skill of the planetary militias, a result of Davian training, and he was soon sending in his reserves where the situation became desperate on all three worlds. These reserves helped stabilise the situation, and the two sides entered into a prolonged slugfest along the front. The Alliance had a rare numbers advantage, but the Draconis forces were better equipped and supplied. That last factor turned out to be the crucial one, as Kiritan supply ships came at regular intervals for the rest of the year to replace lost units, whereas the Outworld's defenders were gradually ground down until there was almost nothing left. The battered remnants of the 1st and 2nd finally withdrew early the next year. <laughs> 